Last week we were talking about the birth of Jesus Christ through Joseph's eyes. That's in the Matthew account tonight, today, I'm sorry, we're going to go through the birth of Jesus Christ through Mary's eyes, and this is in Luke. There are more verses. This takes a little more space. I will probably not take any longer to cover it today, but think about these words from last week and this week. For everyone in this room, they are very familiar words. You have read them numerous times. You have heard them read and spoken, and in many cases you've sung them. In fact, we have sung most of the story of the birth of Jesus Christ in various songs through the years. But one of the things that I have found, and it's true in this case for me, and I pray it will be true of you, is that every time I revisit uh, the Word of God, even if I'm very familiar with it, there's something new and life releasing, light releasing that comes to me. And this has happened in my study on this just in the last few weeks. So starting at Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. The word favor is the word charis. It's the word grace. You have found grace with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and you will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus. Now, one thing that I find interesting when I have restudied these two events, uh, Joseph's version and Matthew and, and Mary's versions and, version and Luke, the angel came to both of them, but came to them separately. Isn't that interesting? You know, I guess if I was God, I would have probably thought, well, let's save time here and do this together, you know, put them together and share it. But he did not do it that way. They were going to go through their process of discovery of God individually and then later together. And so in this case, and in both cases, the angel said, we're going to call him Jesus. He told Joseph that, and another time he tells Mary that. This will be his name. Verse 32, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Uh, we've spent time in this arena here about the kingdom of God, and we'll, we'll come to it again. But one of the facets of Jesus' coming was to bring back the kingdom of God ruling through human beings. The kingdom is God's working through people. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they gave up that authority. They gave up that right to rule in the spiritual sense of ruling, not in bossing people around so much, but in controlling. And in doing so, Jesus the King has come and He has come to reign. And these prophecies back in Daniel and in Isaiah and various other places in the Old Testament said there will come one in the likeness of David. But when His kingdom comes, Daniel talks about this several places, His kingdom will be a kingdom that will have no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? Meaning she's not had sexual relations with a man. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born, He will be called the Son of God. Well, you guys have gone through this numerous times in your life, trying to put yourself in Mary's place. We last week talked about how we would see it if we had been Joseph. How would we have related to these things? Now it's through Mary. How could you relate to this? Here's this young girl, a very young girl. Very simple in many ways, I'm sure. Uh, they're not rich people. They're not in high aristocratic arenas of life. She's not even in the holy city. And then this, this angel is appearing to her and telling her things that are just too, too crazy. They're too out there. One of them is that God even has chosen her and, and given her favor 
Why would that be? Because grace is never earned. The favorous gift of God, grace, is never earned. It's a gift. The second being, he's saying, you're going to have a son. And he's going to be the, the king. He's going to be the king of kings. She said, how can this be? I don't, I've never had sexual relations with a man. And he said, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and overshadow you. It's the same uh, Hebrew verb, overshadow, that is found in three accounts in, in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where Jesus goes up to a mountain many years later. Uh, it was shortly before his uh, cross experience. He goes up on a mountain. He takes three of his guys with him, Peter, James, and John. And up there it says he is transfigured before them, meaning he was... He was metamorphosized, spiritually speaking. The Spirit of Christ, the Spirit within him, overtook his body, which I personally believe that's what's going to happen when you get your new one. But anyway, that's me talking. So that happens, and it says there was a cloud that overshadowed them. It's the same Greek verb as this one here. It was the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit came that day and overshadowed Jesus and Peter and James and John. And then it says Elijah and and uh, who was the other guy? Was it Moses? They appeared and they're talking to Jesus. Isn't that incredible? Overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, the, the glory cloud of God's presence. He said, this power of the highest, He will overshadow you. The one who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. We know the story. She's the mother of John the Baptist, as we call him. For with God, nothing will be impossible. I want, I want you to say that with me. For with God, nothing will be impossible. For with God, nothing will be impossible. This is our mother's, was our mother's favorite verse in the latter years of her life. I don't know who got that uh, little wall hanging that she had in her bedroom at home, but it said that with God nothing will be impossible. It actually says with God all things are possible. And mom would quote that. She would quote it long before she was in the nursing home. And the girls took that, that uh, wall plaque and put it on her wall there in, in the nursing home. And so we'd go in there and we'd talk to mom and in her earlier days in the nursing home when she was a little more lucid, she would, she would quote that. With God, all things are possible, she'd say. And if she didn't quote it, I would, and I'd, I'd make her smile at me because that's what she would do. And she'd say, God's really been good to me. She said that a lot. She was right. God's been really good to me. And then she'd think about Dad, and she'd say, he's in heaven, and she'd do this. He's in heaven, isn't he? And I'd say, yeah, Mom, he's in heaven. And then we'd come back with God, all things are possible. In this case, with God, nothing will be impossible. You know, I wonder if we really believe that. You know, I think we do, and I think we do, but not necessarily always for in our world. Uh, a good friend of mine that has passed on now, he's, he's with the Lord, and I do believe that. He said to me, Rick, he said, I can pray in faith for someone else to get their needs met and always expect it to happen. But when I'm praying for myself, I just rarely think it's going to happen. And so, of course, I understood what he was saying, but, but what he's talking about is a misunderstanding of faith itself. And, and it also, even though I told him this, that's somewhat disrespectful to the Lord to talk like that, because if you can pray for someone else and believe it's faith, it's the Lord's faith, then it's the same faith he gives you for those matters of your own prayers and needs. With God, nothing will be impossible. And so this is the beauty of it. Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. She said, So be it. That, that means amen. So be it. Let it be. I agree with you is what she's saying. Now here's the thing about how God works. There's some things God does without ever asking our permission. In fact, He does a lot of things without asking our permission. And then there are things he does because he wants us to partner with him. That's how the kingdom of God works on the in the church today. And so he comes to us. Sometimes he speaks to us through the word or just a, a, a voice that comes up or a thought or maybe another person. 
and he's speaking to us, he's guiding us, he's directing us. He might be redirecting uh, our lives. He might be changing our lives like he did with me on numerous occasions, one being about 40 some years ago when the Lord told me. He said, I want you to leave SMS and go to CBC. All those initials. And, and funny thing is God knew exactly what he was talking about. I want you to leave SMS and go to CBC. That's what he said to me. You know what I said? Let it be to me according to your word. I had come a long way down the road by that time and I was needing to know, what are you doing, Lord? I said it last week, there's a place where Jesus is talking to some of the Jewish people of his day and they were marveling that he spoke with such authority as if he knew what he was talking about, which by the way, he did know what he was talking about. But they said, you didn't go to the schools. You weren't trained at the uh, rabbinical schools. You're not a Pharisee in that sense. You're not one that grew up through the ranks and, and have been trained. How do you know what you know? And he said, if you will to do his will, you will know whether this doctrine is from me or from the Father through me. If you will to do his will. So what I was saying last week is one of the most important things a Christian can ever do is on a daily basis say, God, I'll do your will no matter what it is. Because in the flesh world we live in, and oftentimes even in the church world, people want to know first, what do you want me to do? And then they decide if they're going to do it. That's not how God works. He wants us to make a decision as an obedient one first. And that obedience is, is a spirit, it's an attitude. And then he says, this is what I want you to do. I'm not saying it never gives you pause when God tells you what he wants you to do. But that pause needs to be as short-lived as possible. What it really needs to be is we come back and say like Mary did, okay, let it be to me according to your word. Let's, let's do it. She knew this was gonna cost her a lot. This wasn't one of those pie in the sky things. We'll talk of that here in a moment. How amazing then is the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus. That she was privileged vessel, chosen to bear God's son. This is wonder enough. For she is a participant in the miracle of the incarnation at a level no other human being can comprehend. No other person was ever going to be, will ever be again, the mother of our God. It is clear that she did not claim to understand it herself, but simply worshiped God in humble acknowledgement of the phenomenon engulfing her existence. She said, my soul magnifies the Lord. We can hardly fathom the bewildering moment she experienced when Simeon, we'll get to that here in a little bit, prophesied future mental and emotional suffering that she would have, which by the way, she did. When she and Joseph spoke with Jesus after they thought he was lost in Jerusalem. Or when Jesus gently rebuffed her at the wedding in Cana. When Jesus seemed to reject her and his brother's efforts at helping him, though they clearly did misunderstand him at that time. Mary is also a study in the pathway forward in God's will. She might have sought elevation and position, a lot of human beings would have, by the way among those who saw Jesus for who he really was, that's the Messiah. But instead she remained steadfast with him all the way to the cross, rather than to protect herself. She even obediently joined Jesus' disciples in the upper room, waiting as he had commanded for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Mary is truly a model of responsive obedience. Now I wanna stop for just a moment and say what you already know. This wasn't just one of those warm fuzzy deals that she gets to talk to an angel and then from that point on it's just smooth sailing. Because for the most part, it was anything but that in her life. It was constantly dealing with the, the people that are going to misjudge her, people that are gonna criticize, and then her trying to deal with who is this one, knowing it's God coming through her. But think about it, he was 30 years old before he even began his ministry that we call ministry, 30 years. Think about what she was dealing with for 30 years. This boy growing up, he's the son of God, and yet she also is his mother. And then the kind of things that, that, that would grip her heart, but especially, especially at the cross. She witnessed her son being murdered 
terribly murdered, terribly uh, violated, and, and, and caused such, such shame, such shame. This is her son. He's the, he's the Lord, but he's her son. So verse 39 of Luke chapter 1. Now Mary arose in those days, just after the angel departed, and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. That's the one that the angel was talking about. I don't know this specifically, but it says it was quite a long journey, actually, and it was a da dangerous journey, they said. The hill country was not a safe place for a woman to be, and I don't know if she went alone or not. It happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Now you, you know God showed her that. Mary hadn't said anything yet. Mary walks into the room. The Holy Spirit comes upon Elizabeth and she begins to prophesy. For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb. She's talking about John the Baptist. He was one of those uh, Pentecostals, got jumping around. Verse 45, blessed is she, that's talking about Mary, who believed. For there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. I'm going to say it again. God comes to us and he does a lot of things in life without ever asking our permission. And he's just going to go ahead and do some things. But there are others he's not going to do unless we walk with him in faith. Some will say, well, that doesn't sound fair. Well, it's the way of God. He works that way. That's what he's doing is he's making us into faith people. People that are saved by faith to start and then live by faith. And so he comes to us and he gives us direction and word. He expects us to obey him with faith. And Elizabeth said to Mary, you are blessed because you believed. And there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Verse 46, and this is, now Mary is going to sing a song that's actually found back in uh, 1 Samuel, and it came through the voice and the, and the word of Hannah back in the days when she was also a woman that was elderly, that God caused her supernaturally to have a child. His name is Samuel, and he was going to become a prophet of God. One of the key prophets of the Old Testament was Samuel. Hannah spoke much of this song, not exactly the same, and Mary's going to quote it and sing it. She said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations they will call me blessed. And she's right about that. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And Mary remained with Elizabeth for another three months, and then she came home. Start at chapter 2, verse 1 of Luke. Came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the world should be registered. This, this census first took place in Quirinius' day. He was a governor in Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up to Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. I paid uh, personal property tax online yesterday. Something like that is what's going on here. He had a donkey and some chickens maybe or something, and he's going to have to go up and, and pay the tax and be registered. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. That's such a neat story. It's not necessarily clear in Scripture 
exactly what that means, but we've kind of interpreted that various ways through the years. There's no certain date can be established for the birth of Jesus. We do not know exactly when or why the church chose December 25th, for instance. The first recorded celebration of Christmas was in Rome in AD 354. We, we, are, we are celebrating that at, on the 25th of December now. There's nothing about that specific day that's holy. Uh, very unlikely that in fact on the calendar it was on that day when he was born. That doesn't seem to bother the Lord. What it is is we're, we're honoring Jesus, right? We're honoring his birth. We're honoring his coming. Luke chapter 2 verse 8. There were in the same country shepherds, one of my favorite stories, living out in the fields, keeping watch over the flock by night. You know those shepherds, they were probably saying, Craig and I were talking about labor unions earlier, probably thinking, we need to join a union, we're not getting paid enough for this. This is hard work, it's, it's day and night, you get no respect, no honor, watching those sheep, you know, and they're not that great to talk to. And, and they're out there, and here's God revealing himself. He did it last week to three wise men that are not even Jewish people from the East, three that are studying the stars. Now he's going to appear to three shepherds, just shepherds out there. And behold, the angel of the Lord stood, stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. There isn't one human in this room that would, would have done any different. It would have scared, the, as Grandpa would have said, the daylights out of me. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. This is something Jesus is going to say a lot in his life here on this earth. Do not be afraid. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. You know, we could sing that, right? Those words are in songs constantly in this time of the year. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Now, I said it last week, one of the things that it appears that oftentimes the Jewish peoples of Jesus' day, and especially the learned Jewish people, didn't understand that when the Messiah came, he was coming first and foremost as a savior. They didn't know that. They didn't know they needed to be saved. Kelly was talking about the law. They had the law. They thought that was enough. They wanted a Messiah to come as the king to set up a government that would set up an army and would take over Rome, would defeat Rome and cast them out. That's what they wanted their Messiah to be. And he did come as a king, but not that kind of king. But he came as a savior. And that's what the angel is telling these shepherds. This will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. You know, that's where I should have those sound effects behind me, where there's a big thunderous boom, and you hear all that, and then you hear the choir and the, and the instruments and all of, the, all of this noise going on, but it's, it's orchestrated noise. And they're worshiping God. I have never seen firsthand that right there. But I can tell you right now, I have seen in my spirit, when I am worshiping God, I've seen the voice of the angel, the face of the angels. I've seen it in the room with me, and I've seen it in the heavenlies. I have seen this happening. And I wrote a story years ago, a, a whatever you want to call it, a message that was going to go on our, our magazine that we printed at the church, God's Music. And, and it's still to this day, it's one of the the most incredible things I have ever written. And the Lord is the one that did it. But it's not about music per se. It starts with that. It talks about well, what's, what's God's favorite kind of music? Because guys, I don't know if you know this, but people can be very prejudiced of what they like and don't like. Whether it's food or music or clothes or where we, where we live. Prejudice is, is so human. And one of the things I started dealing with on the very first day I started leading young people and then later adults in worship is how very prejudiced people can be about the music that gets in the way of the worship. And it grieved me because though I was a human being too and I have my preferences, everybody does, it grieved me because I understand 
at times we're so disrespecting the Lord when it comes to actually worshiping Him. Some would say there was a couple of churches downtown years ago. They were of the same denomination, but they were separate buildings about, about a mile apart, less than that actually. And someone decided in the hierarchy of that denomination, let's just put these two together and, and save some money and so forth. And boy, those people weren't going to have it. All it was was buildings. They weren't going to have it. So this story about God's music was not so much about music as about how very small-minded and selfish humanity can be when they don't let God really take that out of them with the cross and the Word and the Spirit. And so here they are singing and worshiping and praising God. I don't know if there was a pipe organ involved. I don't know if there was electric guitars. I don't know how that happened. I'll tell you what these shepherds weren't worried about. They weren't worried about any of that. They were excited to be in the middle of whatever was the greatest worship service they had ever been in in their life. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing that has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. Now I don't know if they had subs that could watch the sheep while they're gone. I don't know what happened. Maybe they just left the sheep, you know, <laughs> said, guys, we'll be back. But they're gone. And they came with haste and they found Mary and Joseph. That's interesting how they even found them. And the babe lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things and she pondered them in her heart. She didn't just ponder them that day. For 30 years she pondered these shepherds coming and saying what they did, the wise men coming from the east, and then all the things that she was going to deal with, she's thinking about that. You would have done the same thing. You would have thought, well, I'm not sure exactly how to put all this together. And the shepherds, they returned to their homeland, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Verse 21, And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And as it is written the law of the Lord, every male opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And that was for Mary's purification. There were two things they came to the temple to offer sacrifice for. One was to redeem the firstborn son. I'm going to speak of that in a moment. That's Jesus. And the other was a sacrifice that she was to offer a time of purification after she had a baby. By the law, that's what she was supposed to do. Now when Moses was sent by God to save his people from Egyptian bondage, Pharaoh was stubborn about letting them go and the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, all firstborn males, they belonged to the Lord. That's what the, the Old Testament law says. Every male that came out of the womb, Jewish male, from that point on belonged to the Lord. So there was a ceremony that the parents followed to redeem their firstborn sons. Uh, with five shekels of silver. And what this means is, if they hadn't done that, according to the law, that, that child needs to go into the service of the Lord. Priest, and whatever. Even if they were not born in that lineage. They belonged to the Lord. I'm the firstborn son in a family. That doesn't necessarily mean I've had all the perks. In fact, there's some of it I just soon not done, had to have. But the bottom line is that's where I was at. In the Jewish world of that day, the firstborn also often got a, a greater uh, uh, airship as a result. And I don't know that that sounds right to anyone, but that's kind of the way it was. They're, what they were given at the death of the parents tended to be a little more than the others, and I don't think that's right, and I'm not offering that, Kelly, in case you want to know. But they also had to redeem these firstborn sons in order for them to come back and live with them. So God provided a, a, an offering for them to give. It's five shekels of silver. That wouldn't have been too hard. Verse 25. 
And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was just and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. What does that mean, waiting for the consolation of Israel? Let me read to you two portions in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, which we sing these also. In fact, I wrote a song with this, these words. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This prophecy came seven, eight hundred years before Jesus. Simeon is waiting for this. Also in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 9, it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. It's a prophecy of the coming of Christ. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and we will rejoice in his salvation. Those are just two places in Scripture that speak of what Simeon was waiting for. He was waiting for the Messiah to come, the consolation of Israel, to console his people, to save his people. So back to Luke chapter 2, verse 26. It had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, Simeon took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, Lord now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. This guy was an older guy. He's been around a long time. He's just and devout and he's seeking the coming of the Lord. And he said the Lord had spoken to him that he wouldn't die till he saw the Messiah. And here he comes. And, and Jesus didn't come in with a sign on him that Mary and Martha had put, this is the Messiah. They just come in. Simeon knows by the Spirit this is him. He grabs him. I don't know if it offended or upset Mary, but he grabs the child and he starts blessing this child. And he blesses the Lord. And he said, I can now die in peace because you have fulfilled your word. <coughs> For my eyes have seen your salvation. Verse 32. He is a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, which again, the Jewish people didn't seem to get this, even though it had been in the prophecies. And he's also the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined. He's prophesying here for the fall and for the rising of many in Israel, for a sign which will be spoken against. Uh, well, we could go to many places in the New Testament. The fall and the rising, John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. When Jesus came to his own, his own did not receive him. As many as did receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. The fall and the rising. What, what determines the fall and the rising of people today? whether they receive Jesus or not. That's it. That determines not only their fall and their rising in this life, but in the forever to come. Scripture is very clear that those that will reject the one that Father God has sent as our Savior and our Lord, they will not be with the Lord. They will go to the lake of fire. So the fall and the rising determines if we believe or not. Choose to believe. Well, God then brings us faith, and then He expects us to use it. I can't imagine and can't tell you all the greatness of God. I don't, I don't understand. Well, why does this person walking down the street there not know you, Lord? And there's not really somebody there in case you're <laughs> one. I don't think. Why do they not know you? I don't, I don't know. Have they heard the word? I'm not sure. Maybe I have spoken to them and they still don't know you. But he gives us faith and then he expects something from us. He expects us to use it the fall and the rising. He said, this man, this, this one is going to be responsible for a lot of people rising, and that's in the faith and the life of God, and the fall, because they did not choose to believe. Luke chapter 2, verse 35. 
And he's going on in his prophecy, Simeon is, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. He's talking to Mary. That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. He's saying, you're going to have some tough times out of this. Not that it wasn't, was always hard. There was beautiful times, I'm sure. But he said, a sword's going to pierce through your heart. And probably one of the most obvious times was the day that Mary's watching her son be killed on the cross. Can you imagine what that would have been like? He said, and also that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Over in John chapter 19, verse 25, there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister and Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. And then Paul speaks of something else about the hidden things. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise, praise will come from God. What he's saying is, eventually, there will, be, there will be no darkness to prevail. There will be no lies to prevail. There will be no hidden things to prevail. It will all come to light. Because the light has come through Christ, but yet here on this earth today, as, as Isaiah 60, 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 says, the light has come, but the darkness is still covering the earth too. So there's a war that's going on, and it's between light and dark, truth and evil, right and wrong. And even then, how we fight the war is important. Because oftentimes, as I've said incessantly to our group, some good Christian people are fighting the wrong fight. Sometimes they're fighting the wrong way. There is a way to fight in the spiritual world, and then there's a way not to fight. Luke chapter 2, verse 36. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, the daughter the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, meaning she was probably at least as old as some of us, if not a little more, and lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. This woman was a widow of about 84 years, so she's got me beat just a little, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. Now, Scripture doesn't say God made her do that. This has just been in her heart. She's been a widow for a long time, and one of the most important things to her apparently was to seek the Lord, and she would come to the temple and fast and pray. Coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of Him to all of those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. She is recognizing the Messiah. So when they had performed all things, that's Joseph and Mary, according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit. And he was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. And I want to go back to Luke chapter 1, verses 37 and 38 one more time. The angel said to Mary, with God, nothing will be impossible. And then her response, then let it be to me according to your word. This is basically how your life is to go. Your life, my life in Christ, is to be a life where God speaks to us. He speaks through his word. He speaks by his spirit. He can speak through a message. He can speak through a song. He can speak through the, the creation out here. He can speak to us. And then what does he want from us? He wants us to respond in faith and say, okay, I'll do it. Because it isn't faith if you don't do it. Uh, Jesus, what some would call his half-brother, his brother James, was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And he wrote a, a letter that we have in the New Testament. And he speaks of this a lot because what was happening in his church is people were using words like faith but they weren't obeying the Lord. And he's saying that doesn't work. He's saying faith was given to you as a gift, but in order for it to really be uh, effective is we have to obey. We not only believe it, but then we do it. We obey it. And so this is an ongoing experience of yours and mine as Christians, as God is continually talking to us. If he's not talking to you any longer, then it's, it's something on our, our end that's the problem because he's wanting to talk. Now, I'm not saying that every second of every day he's speaking out loud to you audible words, but I'm saying he continues to communicate. And I reread quickly a 
book that I had read many years ago. It's called Sensitivity uh, of the Spirit by R.T. Kendall. I recommend it highly. I don't know how many of you may have read that book. If you have not, I, I recommend you get it. It is a good book. R.T. Kendall, Sensitivity of the Spirit, because it may be one of the most uh, needed ingredients to a Christian life that may not be happening enough today. In fact, let me say it different. It's not happening enough. God's children as a whole, as I see it out there in the world, they're not, a, they're not very sensitive to the Spirit of God, to His voice. And then secondly, they're not that sensitive to the spirits of the people because they were all spirit beings. Sometimes people can be very callous about how they relate together, especially in the church, and there's no place for that. There is a place for being honest and, and truthful to people. Uh, there's a place for correcting even at times when it's necessary, but there's no place for that harshness that oftentimes comes. Most of the time that comes out of our own frustrations or our anger or our desires. You know, as you know, in this world we live in, a lot of people's uh, definition of how love works is I'll love them if they'll love me. I want something from them. And Scripture is very clear about God's love. That's not how it works. You love them because you do. You don't love them because you get something back from them. Some will say, well, they're not going to give it back to me. I'm not going to give it to them. Well, that's a not... Uh, God can sort that out, but it's the spirit of it that we talk about. It's, it's that... I'm not in this for what I can get from them. I'm in it from, for loving God and loving His people. And the sensitivity of, of discerning the Spirit. Uh, you guys have heard the phrase, uh, read the room. Sometimes you're in a situation with people, you need to figure out who you're with because it might determine what you do, what you say. Sometimes we don't, aren't sensitive enough to the Lord to, as they say, read the room. Because uh, what we've found, those of us that have had more than one child, uh, you can have two or three kids come out of the same womb, and they can be very different. And how you relate to them, how you care for them, how you discipline them, oftentimes is going to be different, right? Craig doesn't deal with that, but others in our room. <laughs> He's got two kids, and, and they, are, they love each other with the greatest of love, but they are very different in personality. So how you relate to them. How do you read the room? How do you sense the spirit in this person? And in the advertising marketing world I was in, as you know, many years ago, I, uh, in advertising, they had uh, numerous meetings a week to try to keep us pumped up. Because we want, they wanted us to go out and sell stuff, right? Sell advertising, in this case, with a radio station. And we had several staff sales meetings. And they asked me to lead one one time which they didn't do. They didn't do that. The bosses always did it. And I don't tell you this story to make myself sound great because I really didn't deserve it to be so. I, the only thing I think of is that God put it in my boss's heart to have me do it. He said, I want you to lead this Saturday morning uh, sales meeting. Well, they didn't want to be there anyway. Nobody wanted to get up and be there at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning, right? And so here we are, and they come dragging in, you know how it is. And, and so it was in a day before we had smartphones, and we didn't even have an internet or the things we call PCs were just barely becoming a thing. We had one PC in the whole building. Nobody knew how to use it except me. And I didn't use it for anything except to make graphs and pictures, stuff like that. So my boss asked me to lead the meeting, and he didn't give me any uh, direction. He just said, I want you to lead the meeting. So I said, okay. So they had, you know, the whiteboards, the uh, grease, is that what they call it, grease boards, where they had the markers that mark on them. So we had one of those, and I got the markers out, and I just wrote up on the board, spirit, soul, and body. And I said, here's the way this works. Everyone in the room knew I was a pastor, but I never made a thing of it. Never talked about it to them unless they asked. I said, every human being is a spirit being. Everyone is. That's, that's the image of God, spirit beings. But in that image, he also gave us personality. We could call that your soul, or we could call it your mind, your will, and your emotions. And then we all live in a body. And I said, every person that I go out to see to tell them about our radio station is a spirit being, they have a soul, they have personality, and they live in a body. 
And I said, I haven't found one that that's not true of so far. And I said, when I go in and, and get with them, I intend this to be a long-term thing. I need to get to know them. Because if I'm actually going to do a good job of helping them bring in new customers in their business, I need to know something about them and their business. It wasn't one size fits all with that radio station. It had a lot of people that listened at least to the, to the news and weather, but it wasn't one size fits all. And so how were we gonna actually bring people in? Because they're gonna pay me money to advertise over the air, they called it. How are we gonna do that? Well, I had determined I needed to know something about the leadership and the people that work there and I need to know what their business is, something about their business because I'm going to write commercials and I'm going to put it on our radio station and I'm going to ask people to come there and do business. So I would spend earlier portions of my knowing these people just getting to know them. And so I was either talking usually to the owner of the business or to the boss, the manager. And oftentimes we'd end up in a private room somewhere, their office somewhere talking, and I'd just be asking them questions which was kind of surprising to them. And oftentimes they were real busy, you know, and some of them didn't want to spend that kind of time. So you read the room and you deal with that. But I, tell, I was telling this sales staff, I said, what I do is I need to hook up with them and spirit to spirit somehow. And I said, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I cheat because God lives inside of me and he helps me with this, but that's how I do it. And I hook up with their spirit, but our personalities need to connect somehow. I need to know something about them. And the way that happens is you, you get them to talk. You ask them questions about themselves. And you know something? People love talking about themselves. And so it was never a problem. When I would ask the right kind of questions, they'd start. I've known people that are Christians forever, and they don't get this. You really want to hook up with somebody? Ask them questions. Not because you are just trying to work them, but to get to know them. And boy, they'll start, it'll come out. And after a little bit, they're telling you stuff that you may not have even intended to know. And it was not uncommon when I was in those settings that they would start, as I say, spilling their guts to me about frustrations in their life with their kids or a spouse or possibly the management above them pressing them so hard that they feel like they're going to die. And so I would hear these stories. And so I'm telling the sales staff this, and I said, I'm hooking up first with their spirit. And what does that mean? Well, it means that I want the best for them. And if I don't, and this is where some of the bosses may not have liked it, my bosses had no problem with it. I said, if I don't care about them, I don't belong there. So I start with the spirit, and then I go to the soul, their mind, will, and emotions, their personality. And I'm asking these questions. And then I'm finding out, what do you do? Here. How do you do what you do? And how can I let people know this in a way that it will help them to want to come? So we finished this meeting. It was a, I don't know how long it took, probably 30 minutes. That may sound um, impossible to you that it would have been 30. You probably thought it was three days. But. <laughs> and so we finish and, and the meeting's over and everybody's filing out and I'm walking out and my boss stops me. He says, that's the most incredible thing I've ever heard in my life. Well, that was something we talked about all the time in our church. All you gotta do is go read Watchman Nee, some of his books, or read the Bible, and find this out. But you see, you can take that principle and apply it here. So what I'm saying to you and me is this is the season where we talk about Jesus, and that's a good thing. And we talk about light, and we talk about life, and we talk about joy. All these are good things. But really, all of that is, is something that's just kind of bubbling up out of us. It's us. It's, we are that. We are the light. Jesus in us is the light. We are the source of life to these people oftentimes through these words. And, and we're sensing the Spirit. We're sensing with them like when I go back there and talk to Terry in the morning before ch church starts or these other ladies. There's, they got some good folks working here now that, and I don't mean the others weren't good, but these folks are, they're here every time and they're doing what they're supposed to do and they've got a good attitude. And, and I go back and talk to them and I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to sense where, where we're at here together. 
I think I told you a couple of weeks ago, one of the ladies that's, that serves back there, she came to me. She said, you know, we've got these groups in the next two rooms, and they're all marveling at your sign that says the Garden Church. They want to know, where'd you get that name? And, and most of them are thinking it's because we're in the Hilton Garden Inn that we're the Garden Church. <laughs> and I said, well, that's not how it, how it happened. Actually, we had the name first. Didn't even know about this place really, except when I came here, I'm walking in the first day. I look up and I see the marquee, Hilton Garden Inn. I thought, well, looky there. And so I said, that's it. And she said, it had to be the Lord. <laughs> and I said, you're right. It was the Lord. It was the Lord. Craig, you want to come in here? So Father, thank you again for our Lord Jesus. Thank you for the gift that's beyond words. It's inexpressible. Thank you today, Father, that we are alive with the life of God, who is Jesus himself within us. I thank you, Holy Spirit, because you are with us. You're in us. You transform us. You guide us. You lead us. And Lord, in one sense, as Kelly said earlier, we not only can't save ourselves, but we can't save anyone else, but the life within us. Ah, your life. Your life not only has saved us and continues to save us, but so it is that your life within us can bring salvation and life to others. And I thank you so much, Lord. I thank you so much. For surely the presence of our Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of our Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of my Lord, he's in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. And I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely of our Lord is in this.